Hey, listen up. We got another episode of Wise Cracks. Featuring the crack man himself, Bill Krakenberger. And our co-host, John Orlando. Straight from Las Vegas. Wise Cracks is your ticket inside the world of sports betting. With tips, picks, special guests, and more. Only on WSN.com. Welcome back to a special, and I mean this is a special wisecrack we've got today, Bill. You might be on the East Coast and I might be at home still recovering from whatever it is I have, but what a special show we have in store today. Tell the nice people who you've got. Yeah, this is, this is a special show. Uh, a friend of mine for 20 years, Holt McCallany, and he, he's just a special. His stories are unbelievable, and even me on the phone with him, uh, a simple phone call saying, would you come on with us, lasted an hour and 10 minutes. He's that uh, intriguing, and, and he's just, he remembers where he comes from. He's my kind of guy. So this, this, is, this so, is fun. Yeah, let's, let's skip our usual type of show, and uh, everyone knows what's going on in sports. And uh, let's just get right to the interview. We pre-taped it, and uh, here it is right here. All right, Crack, we're three years into doing this show together, I believe, and I can't believe you keep uh, pulling out these surprises uh, of the people that are in your phone. Our guest today is one of those surprises. He's a phenomenal actor. He's appeared in some great movies uh, over the past uh, 25 years, including Three Kings, Fight Club, Sully, uh, Jack Reacher, uh, I mean, Wrath of Man. Uh, he recently played uh, Bill Tench on one of Netflix's most popular series, Mindhunter. Uh, he can currently be seen on AMC 61st Street, which I have yet to see. Uh, and he has a special connection to you uh, and your friend, uh, Teddy Atlas, which I want to yeah. hear all about. Please welcome Holt McCallany to Wise Cracks, everybody. Hey, Holt. Hey, Bill. Hey, John. Nice to be with you guys. You too, thanks man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Appreciate you taking time out of... Uh, your, your uh, start of summer schedule here. What are you actually doing now, Holt? Uh, now, now, do you have a, a shooting schedule over the summer or you're pretty free, which will be great? Well, look, I got to go to, I got to go to LA uh, uh, on, uh, on Saturday uh, uh, for some meetings uh, here. I just came back uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago um, from a shoot in, in Europe. I was doing a, uh, a television show for Apple TV called Foundation. Uh, which is based on the work of a famous science fiction writer named Isaac Asimov, whom you may remember, he's considered kind of the godfather of the genre, you know, uh, uh, similar perhaps in, a, in the way to that the, the J.R.R. Tolkien is considered the godfather of the fantasy literature genre. And um, so I was working over there. I was, in, uh, I was in the Canary Islands and Madrid. I was in Paris and Prague and... Uh, I went to Ireland too because I have family over there. So I, I came back. I came back from there, and um, I had to do uh, some promotional work for the new show that I'm on, 61st Street, which is on AMC Plus every Sunday night, and it can also be seen on Apple TV. If you watch it on Apple TV, you don't have to watch the commercials, which is nice. Um, and that's a very uh, that show was very well received. It's a very hard hitting show about. Uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of about the Black Lives Matter m movement meeting, sort of like, uh, you know, uh, police corruption in Chicago. And uh, I, I, I play uh, the, the bad guy on the show. So, uh, but it was, a, it was, a, it was, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I got to tell you, I, uh, I had a lot of help with the, 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 the role from, uh, from a lot of guys uh, in the CPD who were very generous uh, with their time and who really helped me to understand, you know, uh, the mentality and, uh, uh, you know, and also the procedures, how to, how to conduct an arrest. They take me along on, on ride alongs and visits to the station house and invite me for dinners with their families and St. Patrick's day with the Irish cops on the South side. I mean, I, they were, they were, they were, they were very good to me, but the show just uh, full disclosure is very hard hitting, very, very graphic. And it really tries to tackle, you know, um, uh, you know, a very controversial issue in society right now, which is, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, the whole, all of the controversy surrounding law enforcement, you know, sure. I don't want to get too political about it, you know, because uh, yep. uh, uh, there are, there are, there are, there, there are other people, you know, that have, you know, you know, different points of view. And uh, I understand that there are two sides uh, uh, to the story. And, you know, and I know that there is, um, 
you know, a history uh, uh, in Chicago. That's 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 unfortunate. You know, where 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 some of these things are concerned, no one is d- disputing that. But I have to say that the Chicago cops that I met uh, were uh, uh, were guys that I uh, I really grew to like and admire. I'll just leave it at that. Wow, wow, wow. Holt, do you know? Uh, do you remember how we actually met you and I? Uh, it's going to be an unusual situation. I just don't know if you remember. Uh, well, I'm going to guess that it must have been at one of our friend Teddy Atlas's uh, 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 charity dinners. Teddy, of course, has the Dr. Theodore Atlas Foundation charity, a wonderful grassroots kind of organization that's helped a lot of people. You know, and I mean, no one knows better than you, Bill, but, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, terminally ill children, do you know what I mean? Or children who need the benefit of an operation that isn't covered by insurance and, you know, and, uh, or, or the victims of Hurricane Sandy, or, I mean, just the, the list goes on and on. It's, a, it's, it's uh, the, the reason that, you know, that I've uh, tried to be supportive of it for, you know, for over 25 years is not just because Teddy's a friend of mine, it's because they do such good work. They really they do. do. And, 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 you know, and, and, uh, uh, whoever you may be, uh, you know, you don't, you, if, if you call up and you have a problem and you need help, there's no red tape, you, you know, they just, they just check it out. And if your story checks out, they write you a check, you know what I mean? Or Teddy will come himself, you know what I mean? Yep. And, yep. And, 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 and speak and, 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 and help. And, you know, it's just, it's just a great organization. It's a great charity. Oh my God. Yeah. They raised so much money. Is that money where we and- met though? I, I fly in for it. I'll get to that in one second. I fly in for it every year. And uh, I, I love being able to, I'm so grateful that I was able to help actually help raise money with them. some some uh, things we put up, charity auctions for the Vegas trip and stuff. It's been great because I love how they help when other places won't help. So how we actually met though. So a friend of mine is in Paris, France and falls down a flight of steps on marble and almost kills himself. He's in the hospital, and I, I'm talking to Teddy about it. Teddy, and I was like, "Oh God, I can't believe my friend, uh, my friend Bumper, uh, is literally uh, in a hospital that everyone doesn't. No one speaks French." And he said, "Well, I have a friend that speaks French," and I said, "Really?" And you were our three-way translator for him and the nurses, and and uh, it was amazing how I got you on the phone first time. I never met you at the time. This is 20 years ago. I never met you, and I. I got you on the phone cold and you were willing to help right away and multiple times uh, throughout that week, uh, throughout that month or deal he was in, you helped him and I was always grateful. And next thing I know, I said, listen, I'd love to come into the city and I'd love to take you to dinner. We went to a steakhouse uh, in the city um, and, and it was just a great, great uh, relationship we built from there. I've, I've literally seen you all over the country. One time I'm out in Vegas at the pool and here you come walking by. I don't know if you remember that. You come walking by, oh, and they like, there he is at the pool and uh, strutting around. It was cool there. And then, <laughs> then I, yeah. And then I met you. And then, of course, we, uh, the, the uh, boxing when, uh, Hall of Fame, when Teddy was, was uh, inducted in the bo- Boxing Hall of Fame, Teddy and Don Elbaum. And you were the, you were the uh, chairman, right? Were you the chairman of the, the, of the, uh, what do the they call it? Uh, the master of ceremonies or the, uh, yes. the uh, master, you know, yep. uh, man, is that what it is? Um, yeah. You know, that was a, that was a really, uh, uh, wasn't that interest. great. Oh, it was wow. great. You know, when I was oh, very good. happy, I was very happy for Teddy because uh, nobody deserves it more. And, uh, you know, everything that he's accomplished in the sport, you know, uh, uh, all the great world champions that he's trained, you know, and, uh, you know, all the courage that he's shown, you know, personally in talking about things that people don't like to talk about, about the corruption in the sport, you know, uh, about the way, uh, you know, that, that, that fighters are taken advantage of, you know, by promoters by judges, by, you know, by, by people with agendas, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I listen to his podcast uh, every week and it, and it, and it, and it often comes up, you know, people don't realize uh, uh, you do bill because you understand, but, you know, even guys that are, that are boxing fans, I know you follow the sport and I follow it too. You know, if a fighter makes it all the way to a world championship, right. And, and, and he gets robbed. 
because you know there's corruption in the judges because the 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 he's facing the house fighter the promoters have an agenda they want a particular guy to get the victory he goes back to the back of the line now do you see what i mean and to work his way back up to that place where he can fight again for a world title you know there's a price that you pay you know in blood and tissue you know, all of those punches that you're taking, trying to, put to, to to claw your way back to where you can get another shot at the title that you should have won the first time. And 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 it's it's deeply, deeply unfair. It's really, really criminal. And and you know, and uh uh and you know, our friend Teddy, you know, who I I, I recall, you know, the, the New York Times once referred to as a rare sentinel of truth in boxing wow. and i always liked that description and it stayed with me all of these years because it's that's that's correct that is that that that, that, that you know that is who he is and look <laughs> you know it's gotten him into trouble let's face it you know what i mean there are people who, who don't like it you, you know what i mean when you when you call them out in that way and you know powerful people you know um, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, the great thing about Teddy, you know, one of the things that I admire him about so much is that, you know, you know, he's really somebody, you know how they used to talk, they, they used to talk about somebody who walks it like they talk it, you, you know what I mean, who's yep. really willing to stand up for the things that that he believes in, even if they involve, you know, you know, uh, 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 personal cost, you know, you know, you know, to him and, 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 and you know, and I'm going, I'm I'm going all the way back to the conflict between, you know, him and Customato, you know, his mentor, whom I know that he admires greatly and has gratitude toward because, you know, Cus was the boxing genius who inspired Teddy to become a trainer. And, you know, all of the things that Teddy accomplished in the sport, you know, probably would never have happened if it hadn't been for Cus's, do you know what I mean, insistence and guidance. This is your natural teacher. You're the young master. You're somebody that can be great at this because he had back problems, you know, back problems that, you know, that bother him even to this day. I don't want to talk too much about that, but you know what I'm referring sure. to. And, sure. And, you sure. know, so, so, you know, um, you know, he's, uh, 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 he's an incredibly uh, compelling character. You know, in fact, um, you know, I'm working with a couple of very talented guys, uh, 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 two producers, a guy named Douglas Banker, uh, who uh, has a company called Five All and the Fifth that's produced a lot of sports documentaries. He did one about Lance Armstrong. He did one about the Dream Team and many others. And a guy named Bob Title, whom I first met also more than 20 years ago, who was a producer on a film called Men of Honor with Robert De Niro and, yeah. uh, and Cuba Gooding Jr. You remember that? And they also- Sure, oh, of course. The, uh, the, the the barbershop movies that were very very successful and uh you know notorious about the 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 great uh you know uh rap star uh notorious big and and um you know i had uh presented some some materials to them you know about because i've always thought that teddy's story would make a great uh television series do you see it with because it's so many absolutely great, so many great characters you think about his father do you know what I mean? You know, you know, you know, you know, he was the he's the son of a doctor. Right. And, you know, his father uh, was, you know, a, a really uh, a really unique and interesting uh, a guy, you know, who uh, uh, spent who founded two hospitals, you know, uh, uh, spent his entire career, you know, helping the poor, you know what I mean, would, you know, would would make house calls, you know what I mean, late at night, years after everybody else had stopped doing that, you know, a real professional. A, a guy who was really, you know, you know, committed, you know, in the way that Teddy does, you know what I mean? When he commits to, 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 you know, to training a fighter. And uh, so, you know, you go from there to, to obviously the, the, the whole, the whole dynamic between Cuss and Mike Tyson and Teddy, you know what I mean? Was fascinating. And then him, uh, you know, leaving Catskill and becoming a trainer at Gleason's gym, or oh, there's a, there's a million stories just there, but then, uh, then, you know, uh, you know, winning the heavyweight championship of the world, you know, with Michael Moore. Sure. You know, when they defeated, uh, you know, at Vander Holyfield, I think Michael became the first left handed fighter in the history of the sport, you know, to be to be heavyweight champion of the world. And then and then, you know, everything, 
you know, that, that he accomplished, you know, uh, in his broadcasting career and the stuff that he's done with the charity, you know. So I, 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 presented, uh, I presented this, uh, you know, to the producers and they said, look, we, 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 we love Teddy. We're big fans. Have you considered doing it as a documentary? And I had just been at the Cannes Film Festival because a very good friend of mine who directed me on that show, Mindhunter, the Netflix show that was so popular, a guy named Asif Kapadia, he's from England, and he, uh, he had won an Academy Award for a documentary about Amy Winehouse. Uh, the singer and um, a great documentary. If, if you, if you, if you like that kind of thing, it's really one of the best I've ever seen. And he had a new one and the new one was about the great Argentinian soccer star, Diego Maradona. Right. And so it was having its world premiere at the Cannes Film Festival and Asif Kapadia invited me to the premiere and I'm sitting there and I'm watching it. And of course, Teddy's story is very different than, you know, Diego uh, was a guy that had a lot of personal problems and a terrible cocaine addiction and he's dead now. And uh, you know what I mean? I don't, I'm not trying to speak ill of him. Sure. He was one of the most exciting people in, in, in the history of sports probably, but a, a Shakespearean rise and fall and you know what I mean? And, you know, getting sure. involved with gangsters and Naples and all, you know, but, um, uh, and, 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 and Teddy's story is, is uh, is is I think a much more uplifting one, you know, uh, uh, you know about 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 redemption. Do you know what I mean? And about what it means to be a champion and to and to be a pro, and about the sacrifices that you have to make, and about fathers and sons. Do you know what I mean? And right. you right. know about the, the impact that our fathers have. You know, I remember him telling me once. You know, we're all prisoners of our parents. You know what I mean? To a certain degree. So, but just in terms of stylistically, not to go on and on about this, but just in terms of stylistically, you know, uh, uh, when I watched the Diego Maradona, which is on HBO Max right now. So those of you who might be soccer fans, I know you got a lot of sports fans, you know, uh, 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 who, uh, who remember Maradona. Uh, he's not an easy guy to forget. You know, if you ever watched, uh, you know, uh, 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 soccer, uh, um, it's really one of the best sports documentaries ever made. And um, and so that would be kind of like the template, you know what I mean, for for what we're trying to do. And 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 uh, uh, we're fortunate in the sense that, you know, there's a tremendous amount of archival footage. Teddy's a guy who's been photographed a lot, who's been interviewed a lot. We've seen him in the corner in these championship fights, you know what I mean? You know, just, you know, it, it, it doing things that no other corner man, I don't think, has ever really done in the same way as Teddy. The obvious example is in the Moore Holyfield fight. But, you know, uh, you could use uh, other examples, you know, uh, when he was when he was training Timothy Bradley. I know that you and I were there for, together for some of those yep. fights when he when he was training Sasha Povetkin and, and, and many other guys. He just has a way uh i remember one of, one of his fighters an irish guy that i really liked named jimmy mcmahon who uh who teddy used to train uh uh, uh uh many years ago and he said that if he didn't do a good job in a particular round if he didn't go out there and do the things that 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 they worked on and that teddy did execute the instructions that he had been given in the corner by teddy atlas he didn't want to go back to the corner because it's more scary to go back to the corner <laughs> and incur Teddy's wrath than it is to stay in the ring and deal with whatever this guy's going to throw at me, you know? So, uh, uh, so it'll be, it'll be, it'll be a great documentary. And, uh, and my hope is that when, uh, and it'll be a great documentary just because, you know, our friend has led an extraordinary life. Sure. That's the reason. And and my hope is that, that then then people will will see that and understand that this can also be a wonderful dramatic series. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll say I'll say a couple things about this too. One, uh Jimmy McMahon is is, is very successful in life now, but maybe sure it's because of those grant those those roots from Teddy. Teddy uh, you know, setting some of that uh, McMahon's very successful on uh, businessman. Uh, going back to the, uh, the last thing with the Teddy's podcast, it's amazing how God has always come through for him in the end with something. So ESPN, let's just call it what it is. Bob Arum, not the biggest Teddy fan, uh, pulled him off the fights and he just does some commentaries. 
now on certain fights. And now this, the fight with Teddy Atlas falls into his lap. Uh, the document, uh, the, I'm sorry, the podcast, which is doing unbelievable. So he, he's doing really good. He found a new career path here with this. He's got, you know, over a quarter of a million fans, tons of views. Uh, the show is great every week. You and uh, you yourself said you watch it every week. So and it, it's I, 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 I called I you do. last week. You were watching. Yeah. And, yeah. and not only that, um, you know, um, I just think it's wonderful, you know, the way that he's been embraced by the MMA community, you know, yes. and, you know, he yes. just uh, interviewed Dustin Poirier again. Do you know what I mean? You oh, know, yeah. he's had, he's had yeah. Dustin on multiple times and he's had many uh, Francis Ngannou, you know what I mean? And Daniel Cormier and even, you know, uh, Dana White, I mean, Dana White, Dana White, White Joe Rogan, you, know, you know, has been on the show, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, 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 it's, and, and why, why is it? It's it's because uh, they really admire Teddy and they know sure. that he knows what he's talking about. And, you know, they uh, they know his history and uh, they know, you know, you know, Norman Mailer was one of my favorite writers growing up. And uh, he doesn't get as much uh, respect as I think he deserves as a, as a writer. I put him up there with Ernest Hemingway and with uh, uh, William Faulkner and with with the great American novelist. And he used to say that nobody is better when it comes to, you know, you know, strategic thinking and breaking down a fight, you know what I mean? Then, then Teddy Atlas, you know, and uh, wow. whether it's in the ring or, or in the cage, you know, you know, you know, Teddy uh, 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 has an encyclopedic knowledge and that, and that, and that hell. And, you know, and, and, and you might think, you know, oh, well, you know, boxing and MMA, you know, are very different, you know, and, and they are, but, but it's still a fight. Isn't it? Yeah. It's yep. still two guys getting in there to fight. So many of the same things still, especially the mental aspect, right? He often says that 75% of the game is mental, right? You know what I mean? Yep. So, so, so uh, uh, I've, I've been very gratified, you know, by the way that, you know, uh, he's been embraced by the, uh, uh, by the MMA community, you know, by the success uh, of the podcast, of his new uh, uh, clothing line. Uh, on uh, on box raw for 36 minutes, you know, and and I think that uh, the 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 documentary is only going to 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 to, to burnish his reputation in that respect. Do, do, do you know what awesome. I mean? Just a, a new audience, more people. Yes, he's a legend in the sports world, and certainly anybody you know with even you know even the casual you know boxing you know what I mean fan you know what I mean knows exactly who Teddy Atlas is. But it would it would be nice to see him become more of a household name. Uh, you know what I mean in the U.S. and and sure. and, and a television show can do that. Uh, a, a, a really good, you know, and that's what we, we hope this documentary, you know, you know, uh, w w will lead to, you know, a really, a really well made, you know, dramatic series in which we in which we tell this fascinating story from the streets yeah, of Staten Island. That really sounds great. Really well, sounds great. You know. well, thanks, John. You know, I mean, you don't just snap your fingers and get these things, but we get closer all the time. You know, this is something that that Teddy and I talked about all the way back in the 90s, you know, uh, uh, they were making a film about uh, about Mike Tyson um, for HBO. And I knew the casting directors, I was a young actor. Uh, I'm going back to 1993, which is the, you know, sadly the year that uh, Teddy's father passed away. And, uh, you know, uh, the very next year in April of 94 is when, uh, is when Teddy and Michael Moore won the heavyweight championship of the world against uh, Evander Holyfield. But it was 1993. And I, uh, I got a call from this casting office and they said, listen, we're going to do a film. We know you're a boxing fan. We're going to do a film about Mike Tyson. Would you like to be involved? I said, well, of course, which part would I play? And they say, we'd like you to play Kevin Rooney. And I said, I can't be Kevin Rooney. And, and they said, uh, why not? I said, well, have you, have, you, have you seen Kevin Rooney? Have you seen photographs of him? Now, now later on, in a in a film that I actually enjoyed with Miles Teller about Vinny Pazienza, an actor named Aaron Eckhart, whom I worked with with Clint Eastwood and Tom Hanks on a film called Sully that you mentioned at the top of our broadcast, John, uh, actually did did play uh, Kevin Rooney, and yeah. um and 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 I like Aaron, and I thought Aaron did nice. I didn't feel nothing against Kevin. I, I, you know, you know, I, I didn't feel that I was, I was the right guy to play Kevin. Rooney. 
And I, I said, but I'll tell you who I would love to play. I would love to play Teddy Atlas. And they said, but Teddy Atlas is only going to be one scene in the movie. I said, that's okay. So I'll play one scene in the movie as Teddy Atlas. I'm happy with that. And they said, okay. And they gave me the part. And so, you know, I, uh, I called Teddy Atlas, you know, and I didn't know him. And I said, uh, Mr. Atlas, uh, my name is Holt McCallany and uh, I'm an actor. And, um, you know, they've asked me to play you uh, in a movie about Mike Tyson. And I was hoping I could meet with you and ask you some questions, you know, about your experiences uh, with Mike and, and with Customato. And um, he said, okay. And he asked me to meet him. Uh, at that time, uh, they had a gym in New Jersey called the House of Pain. And he had, uh, he had two heavyweights, right? One was a guy <laughs> whom you'll all remember named Shannon Briggs. Oh, yeah. all Shannon, remember the cannon. Shannon the Cannon Briggs, right? He was training Shannon Briggs, right? Who uh, uh, used to wear hats that said future champ. You know what I mean? Like he had already declared himself heavyweight championship <laughs> of the world before. He, and I like Shannon. I mean, Shannon had a big personality and Shannon was a funny guy. And, you know, uh, but he had also Michael Moore and uh, at that time. And, and Michael Moore... Uh, who became a friend. And I, 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 I have tremendous admiration for Michael, you know, but Michael was more quiet, more brooding. Do, do, you know what I mean? The, 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 the journalist used to call him boxing's brooding Hamlet. You know, he, uh, he just had a lot of stuff going on inside. And I, I, I watched Teddy, you know, you know, train, train the fighters. And then he invited me over to, uh, uh, his apartment in Staten Island. Uh, this was before they had the beautiful house that they live in now, Bill, that you and I have, you know, yeah, you know, spent time yeah. In. yeah. So in this the, was the, well, did they live in an apartment before then? Am I right? They did on Howard Avenue. Yeah. It, yeah. it was, it was not too far away, really, maybe five minutes yep. or so away from where he's, they He's brought me over there a couple of times. So yeah. Yep. Yeah, but it was, you know, I mean, you know, this was in the days, you know, before, you know, he, you know, uh, you know, was really making bucks. money. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so because, you know, you remember that when they came down from Catskill after that, everything blew up between him and Cuss, you know, over Mike's behavior. Right. And we know that story. So we don't have to, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, go over that. You know, you'll see the documentary and it'll all be there. But anyway, uh, 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 they were living in his father's basement. Right. And yeah. Dr. Atlas. Oh, Teddy was hurt. Right? Yep. You know, and then they had their own apartment, you know, and, and he invited me over there and I got to meet his wife, Elaine, you know, who has now been, you know, a friend of mine for 30 years. And uh, she's the best. Know, I mean, I mean, the greatest tough. lady. She might be tougher than Teddy, mm -hmm. by the way. Uh, you know, and, and I'll tell you, you know, she was so kind to my mother, who's now deceased oh, yeah. Yeah, and right. was such a good friend to my mom. And my mom loved Elaine so much that it was uh you know i'm eternally grateful to her if for not all the other things you know what i mean and her generosity and her hospitality and the way that she makes you feel welcome when you go there and the fact that always, she makes these always. fabulous an meals for everybody you know but it great was, cook. But the, and a great lady and just and, and she great was lady. a great friend of my mother and my mother adored her but anyway so i i i find myself at the little apartment there you know you know with uh, with teddy and elaine and you know and you know because i didn't want to bother him while he was training his fighters do you know what i mean i'm not going to be coming up asking questions so uh mr atlas uh, one other thing i wanted to you know it's like <laughs> let, you know you know you know want to you know you know let him do his job but then i had the opportunity at the end of the evening to really talk to him about what had happened with cuss and with mike and um and he told me and, uh, and then I went back uh, uh, to the director, a German director named Uli Edel, and, um, um, who famously directed a movie called, called Last Exit to Brooklyn, if you remember a, 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 a movie I do. By, by Hubert Selby, a terrific, terrific, very dark film. And um, I, uh, I said, Uli, mm -hmm. I said, listen, I just came from meeting with Teddy Atlas. And everything that we have in the script is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's all, it, you know, uh, uh, that's not what happened. And, and th I, 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 this is what actually happened. And I told him, you know, 
uh, the, 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 the actual events as they had been related to me in great detail, you know, by Teddy and they changed everything. And as wow. and, my part, and my part went from being a one scene part to being an important, an important multi-scene sequence in the film, you, 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 you know, so, so wow. that was kind of the beginning of our, uh, of our friendship. And then ever since then, you know, um, you know, uh, we've been talking about trying to do something, you know, you know, with Teddy's story. There was, there was uh, uh, the book, of course, you know, uh, um, and um, you know, we, you know, and 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 the book is 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 great for those of you. It's a great um, book. Oh my God, the book is so good. Who haven't read it? This is oh, it. It's, it's, it's that's it. It's it's called uh, 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 from the streets to the ring: a son struggle to become a man. Right. It's written. Uh, it's written by Teddy. And uh, and was co-written by a guy named uh, Peter Olson, you know, who, and uh, and uh, uh, and that was, so we, you know, we, we had that and we had, you know, I, I conducted like, I don't know how many hours of interviews with Teddy, just the two of us, you know what I mean? Wow. Like night after and I'm going back like, you know, years, you know, but I mean, you know, 50 hours of transcribed interviews, I've got like, like stacks of material. So when we get to the point and we're going to get there you know you know everything has its time i was a young actor i wasn't very well established the years have gone on and i've become more established in the entertainment business the years have gone on and teddy has also become a legend in the sport of boxing do you know what i mean and and like yeah. you say you know he starts a podcast and boom you know what I mean? It's a, uh, it's a tremendous success. So, and now we've got very competent producers attached, you know what I mean? To the documentary version. And we're going to get good produ producers attched to, to a, a, a dramatic series version of it too. It's just. Wow. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was that big, that it was that real yet. So that's, that's fantastic. Go ahead, John. Sorry to. I have to ask a question now that I've, I've only known Holt for about 20 minutes. And my question for you is, you're so nice. It's clear that you have so much heart. How do you play such an incredible bad guy? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Fantastic question. Oh, yeah, because he is that nice guy. You're right. Yeah. You, 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 you just brought away. that. Like, Very good, John. It, good, it, good. Really, it really is a testament to your acting chops because you are so nice. Like, I've seen you in so many movies. Like, I loved Wrath of Man. <laughs> I mean, I Thank loved you, that man. movie, you know, uh, during the pandemic in a theater. Uh, I was like, right, me and man. my buddy Gio were the only two in the theater. And you play <laughs> such a good, like, like yeah. all of your work, you know, all of those films where you play such a bad guy. How, how do you flip that switch? You know, look, you know, uh, 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 a lot of people ask me the same question about this television show that I just did, 61st Street, right, where I play a, a, a corrupt cop, you know, with the Chicago Police Department. You know, I'm a tactical lieutenant on the drug squad, but I'm taking money from drug dealers. And, you know, um, um, I always tell them, you know, you know, men have justifications, uh, the, the uh, rationalizations for the things that they do. You know, they... Um, they might say, I'm underpaid, I'm risking myself every day out there, you know, this money is ill-gotten gains anyway, I'm taking money from heroin dealers, do you know what I mean? I mean, that's not really their money, do you know what I mean? That's, that's criminally earned money, plus, you know, I got alimony payments, I got child support payments, I got a gambling problem, whatever it is, you, you find a way um, to justify your actions. And then you're not the bad guy. Okay. You're just doing the things that you have to do, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, to survive, you know, I mean, uh, it's, 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 it, you know, it's, it's like a guy in the NFL, you know, uh, uh, who, uh, who gets injured and he starts, uh, he starts using steroids, you know what I mean? To try to get himself back out on the field. I'm not, I'm not condoning that. Uh, I don't want, right. I want to make that clear. But what I'm saying is they, you, you, they have a way of justifying that behavior by saying, look, I don't want to lose my spot in the lineup. Right. I want sure. to stay, I don't want to lose my position. I got to get it. You know, that's how you do it. You, you, you find a way to make your guy Right, to justify 
you know, his actions. I mean, I, I was just in a film called Nightmare Alley with the great uh, Bradley Cooper that was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture, you know, and, um, you know, uh, 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 a lot of people felt like, you know, because I kind of play an antagonist uh, to uh, to Bradley's protagonist, you know, um, I don't think I'm the bad guy in that movie. I'm the one who turns out to be right. Bradley was a shyster. I said it from the beginning. And, 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 and guess what happens? He is a shyster. You know, the fact right. that we have an antagonistic relationship, you know, uh, uh, doesn't necessarily make me make me make me the bad guy, you know, and 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 and, and Wrath of Man, you, you only because you mentioned Wrath of Man. So Wrath of Man was originally a French film called Le Convoyeur. Right. Which kinds of is which is a French word for like a cash truck that moves money. Right. And um, and it starred two wonderful French actors. One of them you would know, Jean Dujardin, who won an Academy Award in 2011 for a film called The Artist. Do you remember The yeah, Artist? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Oh, okay. yeah. So yeah. it was Jean Dujardin and a, and a guy who's very well known over there named Albert Dupontel. So I'm in the Jean Dujardin part. And 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 uh, and Jason Statham, who is one of the biggest action stars in the world, is in the Albert Dupontel part. And, you know, and when I watched the original film, you know, uh, what I what I what I what I noticed about uh, about um, uh, uh, Jean Dujardin's performance is, you know, is how, you know, uh, how affable he was, how likable he was how charming and charismatic he was. Yes, in the end of the film, do you know what I mean? You know, we're going to find out that he believes he has a reason, you know what I mean, to, to you know, to, 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 to betray somebody. But he believes that that he has that reason. It was the same experience I had on the, on the project I just did in Chicago. I based the character on a guy named Jerry Finnegan. Jerry Finnegan, I'll say his name now because, you know, he's a friend of mine, the, 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 the film is out. Jerry Finnegan did 10 years in federal prison. He was one of the most uh, decorated uh, Chicago police officers. And, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, he was convicted, you know, of, 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 you know, it was a long indictment, you know, of stealing money from drug dealers. And there was even a conspiracy to commit murder charge. And, and there was, you know, so anyway, he was going to be my template. Right for a corrupt cop. So I'm I'm I, I I'm at an Irish pub on the south side of Chicago and it's St. Patrick's Day, and I'm with all these cops and I'm telling them I'm going to sit down. I get to meet Jerry Finnegan, you know. And I thought that their reaction might be, well, why do you want to meet him? And they all said they all said, you know what, you know what, he was the best street cop we ever knew. He is the most likable guy. He was like a father to me. You're going to love this guy. And when I met him. I found out that, you know, you know, that it, that it was true. You know, it, it, you know, he was this tremendously charismatic, tremendously charming guy. You know, just because somebody takes money, you know, does, you, you know, it, nobody goes to the police academy saying, I can't wait till I'm in a position to rob some drug dealers. Right. <laughs> you, you know, corruption is something that kind of creeps up on you. Do you, do you know what I mean? And, you, you know, you, it starts in small ways. And then before you know it, you, you know what I mean? You're deep into it. And then once you're deep, you, you, it's, like you, it's like you dig yourself a hole and, and, and you can't stop digging. And you get deeper and you get deeper and you get deeper. And that's, and that's, how, you, that's how you have to look at it. You don't look at these characters as, as fundamentally bad guys. You look at these characters as guys that made fundamentally bad decisions that lead that's that, a great that led take. them to a particular point. Yep. That's a great take. All right, guys. Well, summer is here and the action for crack wins is heating up. We got the NBA finals. Obviously, MLB is heading into the uh, dog days of summer. The WNBA, which I actually watched the game the other day, which is crazy. Uh, crack wins gives out all the NBA playoff totals, NBA player props, uh, PGA matchups. I mean, Bill, you've got it all uh, cracking over there. If yeah, I no, say. You, you, you hit it. You hit it uh, out of the park there. Yeah, though we, uh, uh, you know, we're getting into the summer here too. There's going to be summer league basketball. There's going to be uh, the value of WNBA, uh, the, the, the line when we, we get the closing line value, no one else can do. Uh, we, we really have some really good stuff going on. And of course, the main thing is winning. So, uh, we, we want to go over these winners here, especially the proposition bets. Again, we're going to have uh, join now for the summer league because it's going to be special. I think we're going to, uh, you know, really uh, have some great information 
Uh, I never used the word inside information. I almost slipped there and said it. So, but uh, it's good. To, it's good to know lineups and stuff and, and things that we know and find out and let us do the work for you. Crackwinds.com and the Crackwinds app. Absolutely. And after you uh, sign up there, be sure to head over to WSN.com. I don't know if you've had a chance to, to get over there yet today, Bill. Is anything uh, jumping out at yeah. you? I'm on it now again. Boom. So, yeah. Uh, you know, of course, you can get all, all of our latest episodes, all of our episodes up there at WSN.com. But also, the latest news uh, in the sports world, they refresh brand new articles literally uh, every day. And also the industry news, what's going on in the industry, uh, just, just looking around the country, the, the places they're trying to get legal for, for um, uh, football season, the NFL is the big season. There's so many different states. Uh, there's an article there about New York collecting $250 million in sports betting tax. I mean, what a, what a revenue generating uh, thing that is for, the New York, for New York State. So uh, get over to WSM, of course. My number one reason is the bonuses. And literally, if you go on their phone, their, their phone section of the app, it says right there on the bottom bonuses. It, it's a section you, that I really love because they have negotiated some of the best bonuses in the world for you in your jurisdiction. You click on the jurisdiction, you get a pop down menu of all the different state, uh, all the different bonuses in your area. And some of them are amazing. Literally can walk away with thousands of dollars in bonuses and sign up bonuses. So head over to WSN.com and check out those features. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, let, let, uh, you know, I, I actually liked your role in, in Sully. When I seen you there, I was like so proud. I was like, wow, that's my guy out there. It was, just, you, it was really cool. And uh, Tom Hanks, uh, yeah. tell our viewers and listeners your, your relationship with Tom Hanks over the year. Over the yeah. years, what, 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 where'd you meet him? Yeah, you, so, you know? so look, you know, um, uh, you know, I uh, uh, had always wanted to work with Clint Eastwood, number one, because Clint Eastwood uh, was a hero of mine. You know, uh, he's an icon of the American cinema. We were just talking about Wrath of Man. It's his son, Scott Eastwood, who kills me in Wrath of Man. If you remember, uh, 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 okay. John, at the end of the movie, he blows my brains out. And Scott yeah. is also a wonderful actor and, 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 and inherited uh, 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 so much talent from his dad. But I, I, I got offered a part. It wasn't a big part. It was a couple of scenes, but it was a couple of scenes with Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks was another guy for whom I had tremendous admiration because we had both started our careers as actors in exactly the same place. We were unpaid apprentice actors at the Great Lake Shakespeare Festival in Cleveland, Ohio. And wow. uh, I did one season, Tom did like three seasons there. And, 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 and we were really the only two guys that really went, I mean, some of the guys did some film work and some television work, but you know, they didn't become Tom Hanks, you know, uh, not too many guys become Tom, become Tom Hanks. But I knew because of Tom's personality, he had stayed in contact with many of these guys. And you have to understand that, you know, this would have been 40 or 45 years earlier, right? 40 years earlier, but he's still friends with them. And they're regional wow. theater actors. Some of them are really, really good. They play the classics. They do it in rep, but you never heard of them. Do you know what I mean? Sure. And I came in and I said, you know, uh, I'm friends with uh, Bob Bellion and Clive Rosengren and Bob Bruller and Barney Cates. And I started thro throwing out names that no one has ever heard of, but Tom knew who they all were. And he wow. just stopped and he looked at me and he said, you got to be kidding me. I said, no, that's where it all began for me, too, Tom. Uh, you know, uh, you know, sweeping stages in Cleveland, Ohio at the Great Lake Shakespeare Festival. And from that moment on, uh, uh, Tom and I uh, had a real rapport. Uh, we, 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 we really kind of formed a friendship that uh, and, and we would talk for hours. And, you know, and he's such a gracious guy and such a humble star. I mean, for somebody that's accomplished so much, you know, in the entertainment business and is such an icon, he'll say to you, hey, we're going to meet uh, in the conference room of the hotel and uh, and have pizza and we're going to run tomorrow's lines, you know, and everybody will show up, you know, to be to be there uh, uh, with Tom. It's um, it's a wonderful thing when your heroes turn out to be everything that you hoped that they would be and more. 
Yeah. And, and that's kind of what it was like for me with, with Tom. And I, and I would say also with Clint, you know, I got, I got cast off a piece of tape. What does that mean? That means that my agent sends me a script and they say, look, Clint Eastwood is interested in you for a particular part. And, 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 I, sh and I shoot it and I send it to Clint's office and then they, he either says yes or no. So I arrive on the set, but I've never met Clint Eastwood. You know, you know what I mean? And suddenly I'm there, I'm in, and then here comes Tom and hey Tom, and I'm telling Tom the story of Great Lake Shakespeare Festival. And then suddenly uh, 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 Clint, Clint wants to try one. You know what I mean? Let's just shoot one. I hear from the behind, and then now we're doing it, and now we're playing the scene. I still haven't been introduced to the director, so we <laughs> shoot the whole day together. And every once in a while, I'll hear from behind the cameras in that voice that he has, "Hold a little faster." Yes, sir. A little faster. You got it, Clint. You know, and then uh, and we and we do the thing, and and it went very well. I really like working with Tom. And then at the end of it. He walks up to me and he shakes my hand. This is the first time I met him now. It's the end of the day. And he says, very good work today. Very good work. So I gave him a salute like this, right? And he says, and he looks at the whole crew. It's like 80 people. He says, well, he knows how to salute. That's more than I can say for Barack Obama. And, and wow. everybody wow. fell on the floor. Because, you know, there was that thing, right? between him and Obama, where, you know what I mean? He didn't like Obama, whatever, you know oh, what yeah. I mean? But, uh, but that's, a, that's a true story. And um, I just felt like he's celebrating his 90, he's 92, okay? <laughs> so I think that when you're 92, you can get away with saying these things. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Whatever, you know, whatever it may be, right? And, uh, and nobody seemed, uh, Nobody seemed to take offense, but but that's 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 one of the exciting things about being in in my business. It's that uh, you get to meet people that you never would have met. W would I have had the opportunity, Bill, to 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 form a friendship with Teddy Atlas if I hadn't gotten that call from HBO about doing the movie about Mike Tyson? No, I would have been another fan watching him. You know what I mean? Over all those years, but would I have gotten to meet him and to know him? No, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, Tom Hanks, Clint Eastwood. A lot, uh, uh, you know, that the, the the list kind of is very long. You know, of of people that I've got to meet, and even like, you know, you know, uh, uh, we talked about Mine Hunter. You know what I mean? You know, guys, you know, that were in the FBI that have fascinating stories, that have had fascinating experiences tracking serial killers for decades. And you listen to these guys and you and you hear about their experiences and you can't believe it. I never would have had that opportunity. It's only because I'm in this line of work. Do you see what I mean? And I think if you had if you ask me, what is it that I love most about what I do? It's this. It's the fact that I get to I get to play different roles, and that leads me. Uh, that gives me the opportunity to meet different people from different walks of life, and in many instances, they're people that I never would have met otherwise. Awesome. That was a great question we had, but you answered it. Fantastic, uh, John. What do you have for him? Man, I have so many questions for him. I know we, we're probably running out of time, <laughs> but I, I mean, I know I like. Holt, if you don't have your own podcast already, you need to start one because oh, yeah. you, you have so mm. many stories wow. and, and I would think yeah. the people you could sit down with would just be amazing. And this has been a lot of fun. Um, you mentioned MMA earlier and UFC, which was going to be one of my questions and I knew you were a boxing fan, but I, the way you rattled off so many fighters in the UFC, I'm thinking you are a, a UFC fan. Uh, no, abso absolutely. You know, and uh, uh, and I I've known a lot of the guys. As a matter of fact, I mentioned that I'm flying to uh, uh, L.A. on Saturday. It's because um, one of my closest friends in the world, uh, who was one of the greatest uh, uh, MMA fighters uh, in history, um, is uh, is the legendary champion Boss Rudin. And um, I was a student of Boss and used to train uh, with Boss for many, many years. And um, he uh, is, uh, and I was, uh, I was a student at his school and they're doing a big show at his school. And it's on Sunday, this coming Sunday. So any of you that are in at Los Angeles, California, if you wanna see some great MMA, then you should go to Westlake Village, right to the Hyatt Hotel, 
because Sunday afternoon, there's going to be a fabulous MMA show hosted by my friend Boss Rutten, where you're going to see some really, really talented young fighters, uh, many of whom will eventually fight in the UFC. And um, uh, yeah, I was doing a show once. Uh, this was uh, this was after the Tyson film. Um, uh, the the uh, the producer Joel Silver came to me and said that he wanted to do a kind of television version of The Matrix that would have a lot of uh, mm. hand to hand combat and stuff like that. And uh, I think originally, you know, they had envisioned it as being more kind of Hong Kong style. Do you know what I mean? More kind of you yep. know the Jackie Chan, who's a, another legend and somebody that I had the opportunity to get to know and spend time with. And we can have someday I'll tell you about how great J Jackie Chan is. But, you know, um, I felt, you know, you know, you know, our friend Teddy, uh, 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 Bill, our friend Teddy always talks about something called identity. You have to know who your identity is as a fighter. Right. Mike Tyson has a different identity than Floyd Mayweather. OK, and you can't you can't be Floyd and think that you're going to get in there and fight like Mike, because that's not going to work. Do you see what I mean? And I just felt that with my physical assets such as they are, do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? That I had a better chance of fighting with that kind of powerful style, do you know what I mean? You know, that, 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 that Boss Rutten was famous for. So I asked Boss, you know, Boss, I, you know, not that I'm a, but you know, Boss was a huge puncher. Boss was a boss with those liver shots and with the, and, and, and he was a tremendously flexible guy and his kicks were so hard that, you know, and I'm not making any, I was just a student trying to learn, but, I asked him, would he come with me to Canada and choreograph all my fight scenes? And this is the 90s still. So, you know, it's not, wow. you know, so a lot of these techniques, do you know what I mean? You know, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's simple things, rear naked chokes and stuff like that, that we hadn't that we hadn't seen before on on American television because it was all spinning back kicks and stuff. And I want to know exactly when it is you're going to use a spinning back kick in a, in a street fight. You know what I mean? You're not. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's just not an effective technique. So, so, so I, I, I brought Boss with me. We went up to Vancouver. We were working for Joel Silver, and uh, he choreographed all my fights, and uh, uh, and the fights looked great. They were probably about the best thing about the show was Boss's work, uh, because um, because the show only lasted one season. But then when we came back, you know, I continued training with Boss. And for a while, there was uh, an organization called the IFL, the International Fight League, which sure. was like team fights, right? And they were trying, they were hoping to try to be a competitor with the UFC, hoping to be maybe like what Bellator is or some version of that or, you know, and, um, and, uh, and I was a sparring partner. I was a sparring partner, you know, uh, for, for Boss and for some of the guys on his team. You know, I was always the actor. Do you know what I mean? So they were letting me train with the team but you know um but I was their friend and you know and and there was that and even Teddy gave me some of his time when I when I played a boxer uh, on uh on FX I did a show called Lights Out and for the pilot you know uh uh, uh you know uh, uh Teddy trained me and uh you know I'm not I'm sure I was a long way from being, you know, uh, his best student. Uh, but, you know, just the fact that I could be and spend those few hours in there with him. And now he's got these instructional videos. I yes. just watched Giant. the last one last night Giant. Uh, about yeah. defense. The, you know what I mean? And, 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 and I'll tell you what, for those of you who are interested in the sport of boxing, whether you're a recreational boxer, as I am, I'm still doing it, you know, and uh, I was supposed to fight in Chicago on November, in November, and uh, I was on a card for, for these Chicago cops, and my, my opponent pulled out the day before the fight, but I called Teddy to get advice, you know what I mean, about, you know, strategy and stuff, because nobody's better, but these instructional videos are, they're, they're so useful, he covers everything. 
everything. And, and, and if you have a question, you go back and you refer to it and, you know, about controlling distance, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, about, about the importance of the jab, you know what I mean? Uh, 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 you know, slipping punches, you know, you know, you know, uh, 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 last night, you know, the, the one I was watching, which just came out, it's about, it's everything you need to know about defense. I can't recommend these highly enough. You go to uh, a dynamic striking, right? Yep. Dynamicstriking.com and you search Teddy Atlas and you'll find 15 instructional videos that break down the sport of boxing better than anything else you're going to find. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, lastly, I want to ask you something, Holt. This is uh, close to me, too, because we both lost our moms here in, in the past decade. And... Um, uh, you know, I, I had an old fashioned Italian mom. I was real close to spend. I got lucky enough to spend 50 holidays straight with my, both my parents, mother and father, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas. But I have had the privilege and the you know, pleasure of being in your mom's company a couple of times. Once we went to uh, somewhere in New York, uh, we, we went together to go see someone else play. And uh, I, like I said, I've been with your mom a couple of times. Oh, gracious. Wonderful. Uh, I can't even, there's no words to fit. Uh, can you tell everyone what you, your mom and your dad, uh, what, what they did in their life? Of course, your mom had a, had a big career. And uh, can you tell, tell the viewers and the fans? Sure. Yeah. 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 My mother, my mother was a nightclub singer. Her name was Julie Wilson. And uh, she was very, very well known in New York City. She recorded uh, 21 albums over the course of her long career. You can you can find her on Spotify and Pandora and everything. You, uh, 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 because people don't buy records anymore. So that's right. right. But but, you know, she also uh, she also made a couple of great films in Hollywood. Um, uh, one called The Strange One. Uh, which was based on a play called End is a Man that had won the Pulitzer Prize. It's her and uh, Ben Gazzara. Another one called This Could Be the Night with a great Italian actor named Tony Francioso. You would probably remember Tony Francioso. And sure. uh, but she was known primarily as a Broadway actress and did a lot of shows on Broadway and in the West End of London was nominated for a Tony Award. My father actually won the Tony Award on Broadway as a producer. He was Irish and, uh, and came over from Dublin, uh, started his career in New York as an actor Actor and eventually became a producer. So I kind of, I kind of grew up in the business, and um, you know, uh, uh, and I feel like I feel like she was a great, uh, you know, role model for me and a great inspiration, you know, uh, to me. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm happiest about, uh, uh, Bill, and I know you can appreciate this, is you know, uh, about ten years before my mother died, eleven years, she she had a stroke. And, uh, and uh, it was a difficult recovery. And uh, Teddy and Elaine came to, to visit her in the hospital. And, um, uh, and I decided I had been living downtown in Manhattan in a big loft. And I had one of those cool lofts, you know, in Tribeca in the 90s. But it's one big open room you know, with a pool table and a flat screen. And it's a very imp impractical uh, space to try to share with an elderly person. And my mother was also from that uh, generation of New Yorkers for whom Tribeca was some weird place down by Wall Street. Why would you ever go there, <laughs> right? So uh, uh, I, I was fortunate enough that, um, that somebody uh, that was close to me was in the real estate business in Manhattan and he owns uh, uh, several apartment buildings. And he had been a fan of my mother. He's an old guy now, too, 92 years old. And he said, listen, why don't you, uh, he goes, I got, an, I, got an, I got an apartment across the street from the St. Regis Hotel. Well, my mother was a nightclub singer at the St. Regis Hotel for 22 wow. years. It was called La Maisonette. And it was one of the chicest rooms. There was the Cafe Carlisle at the Carlisle Hotel, which is still there. There was the Persian room of the plaza right, which is, of course, the Plaza Hotel, and there was La Maisonette at the St. Regis, and of the three of them, I would say La Maisonette was the one that was the most chic and the most sought after, and the people that used to go and see her show every, the, from Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee, and I mean, every night, the crowd, wow. you have to remember, you know, when she sang there with Sinatra and with everybody else, you know, um, um, in the 40s, after the war, in the days before television existed, you know, what did people do? They went out every night. They went out to supper club. 
and they had, you know, and there, there, there was this great need for entertainment. And she had come from Omaha, Nebraska. That's where she grew up. She was Miss Nebraska in the Miss America pageant. She came to uh, New York and uh, she wanted to be in show business. And at that time, the biggest club in New York um, was owned by Barbara Walters' father, Lou wow. Walters. And it was called uh, the Latin Quarter. There were oh, two. Of course. The Latin yeah. Quarter and the Copacabana. Those were yeah. the two big. De- my dad, de- my dad worked at both of those. I'm sure he probably did. Sure. Exactly. You yeah. understand, John. Yeah. So, so she started as a chorus girl, and then she worked her way up to being a band singer. And that was like a big step up, you know, to be a band singer, you know what I mean? Because now, and then you become a headliner and, uh, and then you can, then you can, you know, you can play rooms like the Cafe Carlisle and and La Maisonette and of course the Playboy Club in London and, you know, and, and all over the world that she kept, and she kept singing until 85. But when she had the stroke, um, I left Tribeca, I moved uptown, I moved her in with me. And for the last, uh, you know, uh, 11 or 12 years of her, uh, of her life, she lived with me. And, um, you know, we never had an argument. I mean, we, I, you know, she, uh, she was just a joy to have around. And, you know, honestly, Bill, I, I, I know that it sounds like uh, a little crazy to think of being surprised when a 90 year old person passes away. But she had me convinced, and, and Teddy and Elaine came to the hospital the night she died. You know, they were there in the room with me when she passed away. But, you know, uh, um, uh, I, she had me convinced she was going to live to be 100 because she had so much life and she had so much energy. And she was, uh, you know, I took her to Paris for her 90th birthday. I took her to L.A. because one of her friends from a famous show by Cole Porter called Kiss Me Kate, that where she originated one of the roles in London. Course, I don't want to go too into the inside baseball here of, you know, you know, you know, b- 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 you know, musicals from the 40s, because a lot of your listeners, you know, are probably going to like, what is he talking about? But anyway, the point is that she was really, really happy. And I was happy, Bill, because I was able to give something back you know, and, and, and be there for her, you know, and kind of make up for the fact that I had been something of a juvenile delinquent, you know, when I was an adolescent and I got kicked out of school and I got, you know, uh, you know, and, 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 and I caused her a lot of stress. And at least there was an opportunity for me, you know, um, um, at the end of her life, uh, you know, to be a good son to her. And, uh, and, 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 and to do some things uh, for her that I know that she appreciated. And, and the last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop, because I can talk about my mother for an hour, and, and, and we don't have that kind of time. But um, when she was 89 years old, the year before she died, she turned to me and she said, you know, Hope, this has been one of the best years of my life. And I thought, for an 89-year-old woman to be able to say that this is one of the best years of my life, yeah, it's you don't write yeah that that made me really happy oh wow that's so uh touching and and uh it's just a testament to to your mom and your dad and 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 look look what you had to do the last uh you know 11 years uh, is living with your mom and never having an argument and, and uh it's just a it's a great story and we really appreciate it and uh, wow, we could talk forever. As a matter of fact, yeah, we've had I, so many guests on this show. We, we've had Teddy a couple times. We have Michael Moore. But there's no one that I actually can go on more with than you probably. And we've had, I mean, John had Marcus Allen on a couple times, Warren Moon. Yeah. We've had, we can go on and on. But the, your story I have three, is- I have three more things I have to say. One, oh, is, one is, I demand we have Holt at least three times a year on this show. That's number one. Oh, yeah. Done. Number two, mm-hmm. I demand dinner in Vegas. However, we got to coordinate it, Bill. It's Anytime. Me, Holt, my dad, <laughs> and you. I'd love Let's that. Let's figure it out. I'd love that. Lastly, yeah, it's, oh. lastly, is this the year, Holt, that we are going to see an iconic World Series, Dodgers versus Yankees, or maybe even Mets versus Yankees, do you see that lining up? Wow, it's such a great question. I I I, I would love it. You know, um, I, I remember um, 
I remember, you know, w- when I was a little boy growing up, my, my hero was Tom Seaver, right? And, you know, and I always loved, I, I loved the Jets, the Mets, and the Nets. And, you know, and it's been hard over the years to be fans of, of so those teams, you know what I mean, at different times, right? But I remember when I was doing the boxing show, the one that uh, that I mentioned, you know, uh, that Teddy held me with, you know, um, they asked me to throw out the first pitch for the Mets. And, I, and it was such an honor for me. And I went to take pitching lessons, right? And I took pitching lessons for six weeks to throw one ball, okay? Because I had seen the actor, Kevin James. Kevin James is best friends with my friend, Boss Rutten. We talked about Boss Rutten earlier in, on the show, okay? And I like Kevin. He's, Kevin's a wonderful guy. And Kevin, Kevin is from Queens, right? He was the king of Queens. Remember sure. this? Kevin sure, Boyd, sure is a lifelong Mets fan and no disrespect, but what happened is what happened. Kevin got up on the mound. He threw it 20 feet in the dirt and he got booed out of the stadium. And oh I my said, God. Oh, that's not happening to me. So I'm there and I'm, and I'm practicing and I'm, pra- and, I, and you know, and I had pitched a little bit at little league when I was a kid, but I had forgotten, you know, that like for, if you're not a pro, right. Once you throw about 60, 70 pitches, practice balls, <laughs> you start to lose, con- your arm gets fatigued and you start to lose control of that ball. At least for me, that's how it works. Yeah. And you get sure. spaghetti on. And then the only thing that you can do is rest it for a couple of days and come back and practice some more, right? And so, and I did this for weeks to throw one ball, right? So I could be on the rubber and get over that. So I get to I get to uh, what we now call City, City Field. It used to be Shea Stadium, right? Sure. And, um, and uh, I'm talking to one of the players, right? One of the outfielders, you know? And he goes, you know who the best guy we ever had throw a first pitch was? I said, no, who? He goes, Prince Harry. And I was like, <laughs> Prince Harry? How could it be Prince Harry? He goes, he's athletic. And I warmed him up in the clubhouse. I said, well, can you warm me up in the clubhouse? And he goes, sure, but you got to ask that guy. There's some guy who's like the, the, the celebrity liaison. Do you know what I mean? Between like the, 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 the club and, and, and the guests. Yeah. So I go over to the guy and I say, hey, listen, one of your players just offered to warm me up in the uh in the clubhouse and he goes oh no 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 nobody goes into the clubhouse and i said well he did it for prince harry and he goes yeah but that's prince harry i said oh okay well where do those of us who are not in the royal family where do we go to warm up you know and he said people don't warm up man they just grip and rip and i said yeah and that's why they throw it in the dirt or, or in the dugout, and they get pushed. So I'm out in the, I know this is a long answer to the uh, to great. The question, but anyway, I'm in the parking lot before the game with my publicist, who's like five foot one, the uh, young lady, right? And I'm throwing pitches, and people are walking into the stadium, and they're looking at me like, who, who is this, this guy? Idiot? Right? <laughs> but I got up on the mound, and I threw a strike. Wow. And, I did the same thing when I did it for the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, a couple of years later. And then I was supposed to throw out the first pitch for the Chicago White Sox when they were on a run and uh, 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 in 2020, I guess. Right. And then uh, was it was it would have been right. 2000 and uh, oh, 2021. And um, and then I got COVID. I got COVID and I had to cancel. I, I threw a party for 200 oh. people. But I'm a Mets fan. So I would like to say. I would like to see I would like to see the Mets uh, 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 be in the series. One final thing that I wanted to say, um, sure. uh, 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 Bill, and just this is, goes back to the uh, uh, last final thing about uh, about our friends' uh, podcast, right? Was um, uh, Gervonta Davis, yeah, and that incredible knockout of Romero, right? Um, there's a uh, there's a site there's a British. Um, uh, a website called Odds Checker, and what I've discovered is that it and and you would know much more about this than me, you know. But but they they offer more different kinds of prop bets and different kinds of bets than a lot of the American sites offer. You know, not just picking the round, you know what I mean, or the method sure. of victory, you know what I mean. But you know, it, it, round group betting, or you know, and will there be a knock? 
one and you know you know what i mean different guys in it right and i noticed that because he was like a you know a huge huge favorite you know what i mean like he like he 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 ended up at, he, he opened at like minus a thousand or something right or minus 900 i mean you know yep. david but i could get him if i bet him by knockout in rounds one through six i could get even money Wow. And and I knew that and, and I knew that from listening to Teddy's podcast that Romero, although he is a big puncher, is a is a is a is a is a, is a, is a bit of a brawler who's not always uh, as 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 responsible defensively as he as he should be. And again, and, and against a guy like Davis, you know, who is a huge puncher. Right. That can be a very bad combination. So I decided to play Davis. Um, by KO in rounds one through six, right? Oh wow! And and he ended up he ended up getting the knockout with like twenty seconds left in the sixth round, and uh, wow. and, wow. and, I, and, awesome. and I won I won a big bet. Um, thanks to <laughs> Paul, thanks to the hey, fight with Atlas and Yeah, that, that, that's it. that's great. Uh, speaking of which, now being in New York, you can legally bet with all these sites now: the DraftKings and FanDuels and uh, right. points bet. Uh, do you have you have you signed up for any of those sites there? It's, you know, New York's the number one state. The numbers came out today for last month. One point four billion in volume compared to Las Vegas, which had less than half of that. New That's York amazing. is amazing. Number New York's the champion of sports betting in this country. Uh, have you partaked in any of those, uh, those, those, new you know, sites? I've been playing, I've been, you know, I, I've been playing with the same guy for so many years that I yeah, feel disloyal right? now. You, you, you yeah. know what I mean? When I go, but I, sure. but, I but, but, you know, uh, my friend Teddy always said that Staten Island was the world capital of sports. The king. The <laughs> right? king. <laughs> that yeah. nobody, that nobody bets more on sports than the guys in Staten Island. So, Absolutely. uh, uh <laughs> uh, but uh, but no, I think it's I, I think it's great. I think it's great that it's legalized. I mean, do you have a theory as to why New York would be betting Las Ve- beating Las Vegas? It's 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 in really ingrained in their blood. You know, me being from the Bronx originally, I know that I grew up around sports betting and gambling and and gambling in general since I'm a little kid. It's a rite of passage. New Yorkers just have it in them, and uh, they're they're always going to be. The gambling capital is the underground capital. People right. find it so great that now it can be legalized, and it's just uh, you know you get a lot of Wall Street guys too. This isn't just you know oh, knock know. around guys. Yeah. You got no, no, Wall no. Street guys, yeah. bankers, lawyers, doctors. Right. You'll see this fallout. By the way, it's pretty soon in five years from now when uh, you won't be able to get into a Gamblers Anonymous class. Being real serious, it's it's, right. it's going uh, to be bad. People are going to fall hard, but. Uh, it actually surprised me. I thought New Jersey would be number one. New Jersey's not number one. By far, New York is the number one uh, sports betting capital of the world, which would mean Staten Island. Very good point. The biggest mm. money pools, the biggest Calcuttas, the biggest uh, box pools for Super Bowl, Staten Island controls right. all of that. Uh, right. you're, you're absolutely right. But, uh, John, this, this has been great, wasn't it? And we can go on and on. This is our I, longest I, I, interview ever. It's great. I'll come back anytime, John. I'll Good. come back anytime. And I, and, and I will. Yeah. 40 minutes ago, I sent Bill a text while you were talking. Yes. And I wrote, this is great. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, he, <laughs> he really did. That was at, uh, that was 45 minutes ago. 45 minutes ago, he actually I wrote. Mean, this uh, is uh, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, man, this is, this is awesome. We, we'd love to get together. We're, I, I've been out to dinner now a few times with Tony. Oh, my God. My hairs stand up on my arm each time. Uh, the last time, John, when he told us that he was with Sinatra at dinner at, uh, in Caesar's Palace, I didn't even know this, after talking to him for two hours on our podcast, and he was with him. When Frank got the call that his mom's plane crashed and oh, Tony God. was with him. Yeah, and oh, I didn't God. know Tony was with him. So Tony had me like my arm, my hair standing up my arms. Just some of the stories. We we took a simple dinner and we sat down for two and a half hours just talking in this restaurant. Yeah. And I'd love for us four to do that. I oh, think my well, God. let's do it. Yeah. I'd yeah. enjoy no, that. Great. Absolutely, John. I look forward to that. Oh, good. Yeah, good, man. Good. Well, this was great. Thanks, man. Thank this you. is this has been great, Holt. Thank you very much. Great guest. Well, thanks for thinking of me, Bill.
It was a pleasure. Oh, yeah. It's our, it's, our, it's, our, it's our pleasure, our honor. My mind is blown from today's guest. I mean, Holt was, I could, we could have sat, I don't know about you, I, I literally could sit at this kitchen counter for another four hours listening to him tell stories. Like he said, he's like, I'll come on three times a year and tell some of these stories. And he didn't even get into any of the things. Like, I know so many more things he didn't even get into. So uh, it, it's really great. And, and, and uh, it, this was special for our, our viewers and listeners that appreciate someone like him and his stories yeah. and his, his, his history between, you know, New York, L.A., uh, movies shot around the world. He's with some of the biggest stars in the world. Uh, of course, with his latest show, Mindhunter, uh, well, that's not his latest show, but his show Mindhunter really yeah. put him on the map being a star of that show on Netflix and uh, being in a Fincher production. It literally cost $100 million a year to, to produce that show. So, uh, yeah, he, he is a, a special person and a, a very kind person and a good person. Like I said, I love to remember where you come from. It's important to me. So, yeah, very good. Fun stuff. Long show, but a great show as always. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. Are you back in town next week? Or, yes. Uh, yes, all right. I'm back. I'll, in all studio right. next week. I think I'm on my last day of my nagging cough. I only had to hit the all mute right. button three or four times today. So, uh, all right, guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.